Hi there. Well, on today's show, I want to talk about a rare uh, pathogen to humans. However, it's a very interesting virus as it has a lot of history to it, a lot of stories, a lot of lore, right? And um, today I want to talk about cowpox. And I want to start out with a story from last year out of Wales where a 15-year-old boy developed cowpox uh, after feeding calves. And this is the first cowpox case in Wales in, they say, from uh, 10 to 15 years. It's been a long time. And um, this pretty uncommon infection was uh, highly publicized back in 2018. Uh, the teenager's mother, who lived on the Rexham Cheshire border, but does not want to be identified, said the calves he had been feeding had nibbled on his hands, causing them to become grazed. He then developed pus-filled lesions on his hands, arms, and feet. She told BBC Wales, we were really unsure what it was. The one on his ankle was worrying. It was weeping a clear liquid down his ankle. After seeing the general practitioner, they got sent straight to the Countess of Chester Hospital, where he was diagnosed with cowpox. I didn't really know what it was, so I was quite concerned. The first thing you do is look on the internet, and that's when I found out it's quite rare. My son was quite embarrassed. It looked quite a mess. They, the lesions, weren't nice, and it wasn't pleasant for him. It took weeks and weeks to go, a long time, and he still has some marks on his hands. So this is back in... Um, this was reported back in, uh, around the summer of 2018. So anyway, that's one of the more recent, um, stories concerning pow- cow pox. And it's, again, like I said, it's a pretty rare thing. Now the Merck manual, and this is a teat of a cow with a cow pox ulcer. The Merck manual says cowpox is a mild eruptive disease in dairy cows. Lesions are seen on the udders and teats. Although once common, cowpox is now extremely rare and reported only in Western Europe. The virus of cowpox is closely related antigenically to vaccinia and smallpox viruses. Indeed, the first two can be differentiated only by sophisticated laboratory techniques. Before vaccination of the general population against smallpox was discontinued, some outbreaks of cowpox in cows in North America and Europe were due to infection with vaccinia from recently vaccinated persons. Uh, And it says vaccinia-related viruses continue to cause occasional outbreaks of teat infection in dairy cattle in South America and buffalo in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, The the disease is spread... uh, during contact when milking, after an incubation period of up to a week, during which the cows may be mildly febrile, papules appear on the teats and udder. Vesicles may not be evident or may rupture readily, leaving raw, ulcerated areas that form scabs, much like this um, picture that they offer on the uh, Merck website. So, let's go ahead and move on to... more information about the cow, about human cowpox infection. And back around, they say, more than 200 years ago, in one of the first demonstrations of vaccination, Edward Jenner inoculated a young English boy with cowpox material from a dairy maid and showed that the boy became resistant to smallpox. Again, we're going to talk about that in a, toward the end of the, today's uh, video because um, there are people that have questioned this. And... Uh, some consider the milkmaid, um, this whole story, a, a something of a myth. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. Uh, a little bit more about human cow, cowpox infection. Um, the virus is believed to be acquired by direct contact with an infected animal, most often a cat in the case of humans, with lesions occurring where the virus gains access through broken skin. Infection generally remains localized at the initial site of inoculation, although lymphatic spread to the in a sporotrichoid pattern and generalized skin infection has been reported. Human-to-human transmission of cowpox has never been reported. 
So, um, etiology. The natural reservoir of cowpox virus is believed to be small woodland mammals such as bank voles and wood mice, with humans, cows, and cats being only accidental hosts. Risk factors for infection with cowpox include exposure to potentially infected animals, as those listed above. Um, risk factors for dissemination of infection include atopic dermatitis and the use of systemic corticosteroids. And the prognosis is typically very good. Uh, human cowpox is usually a self-limited disease, although I believe I've read that there are, have been rare fatalities due to um, human cowpox. And just a little bit more detail on the signs and symptoms. Um, DermNet New Zealand says, what are the signs and symptoms of cowpox? Most human cases of cowpox appear as one or a small number of pus-like lesions on the hands and face, which then ulcerate and form a black scab before healing on their own. This process can take up to 12 weeks with the following skin findings over that period. Days one to six after infection, the site of infection appears as an inflamed macule. Day seven to 12, the inflamed lesion becomes a raised papule and then develops into a vesicle. From days 13 to 20, the vesicle becomes filled with blood and pus and eventually ulcerates. Other lesions may develop close by. Weeks three to six, it says, the ulcerated wound turns into a deep-seated, hard, black, crusty eschar, which is surrounded by redness and swelling. The eschar begins to flake and slow, and the lesion heals, often leaving a scar, so up to about 12 weeks. Other generalized symptoms from cowpox are fever, tiredness, vomiting, sore throat, conjunctivitis, other um, problems around the eye, eye involvement, and large painful local lymph nodes may also occur. And there is no cure for cowpox, but the disease, as I mentioned earlier, is self-limiting. Um, now I want to talk about two animals, right? We, we talked about humans and cowpox uh, in bovine is really rare, you know, despite the name being cowpox. And that is limited to lesions on the teeth of dairy cows, as, we, as we've already discussed. This probably reflects areas of skin most likely to be damaged and to come into contact with rodent contaminated material. In contrast to the disease in cats, which is much more common, cowpox virus does not appear to cause systemic disease or more widespread skin lesions in cattle. The lesions are limited to the sites of the virus entry after an incubation period of three to seven days. Now, when bovine virus does occur, the disease can spread rapidly through the herd, probably on the milking equipment. And of course, milkers may develop the lesions on the hands, arms, and face, as we mentioned already. Now, cowpox and cats is a little bit of a different story. Uh, cats are now the most commonly recognized host of cowpox virus. They are believed to become infected when hunting. Most affected cats come in from rural environments and are known to hunt rodents. Infection in cats have a marked seasonal incidence with most cases occurring between September and November. Cat to cat transmission can also occur, but usually results in only subclinical infection. Now in cats, the most common route of entry appears to be through the skin, but oronasal infection is also possible. So, it, so you can have a lot of, lot of different issues, uh, superficial type of issues with the cat. Um, and there's also the uh, chance of a more systemic type of infection in cats. So, and let me just let share with you a picture of cowpox in a cat. And here you can see the cowpox lesions on the forehead, right next to the nose and here on the arm. Now, several years ago, this is back from 2012, there was a study that came out in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, which talked about uh, the first known laboratory acquired 
cowpox infection in the United States. And this is a summary from uh, SIDRAP News, and they write, a U.S. laboratory worker contracted a painful, slow-healing cowpox virus infection on the job in 2010, marking the first such case reported in the U.S. Though the virus, a relative of smallpox, is known in Europe and Russia, according to the study. Uh, the infected researcher had not worked with cowpox virus, but samples of the virus were stored in a freezer in the lab. And evidence of cowpox virus was found in three samples from lab services, according to the report in the Journal of Infectious Diseases. The lesion on the worker's hand took close to three months to heal, and the diagnosis took even longer. Um... The lab employee worked with a type of pox virus that is not in the orthopox virus genus, a non-orthopox virus, cordopox virus, and does not infect humans. He or she had not received a smallpox shot, though vaccination was offered to workers in the lab on hiring. A painful ulcerated lesion appeared on the worker's finger around July 10, and by July 13, he or she had swollen lymph nodes, Fever, chills, body aches, headaches. Uh, most of the symptoms subsided after five days, but the local pain persisted and spread to other fingers. Uh, this individual saw a bunch of physicians, including a dermatologist and a hand surgeon, over a period of several weeks. And um, the worker didn't think cowpox virus was being used in the lab, and didn't tell so he didn't tell the he or she didn't tell the physician it was stored there. It was finally identified, you know, sometime later. Uh, an official at the patient's lab said the cowpox virus stocks there were, had been stored in a freezer for five years with no known use or movement. Some of the vials of cowpox virus were stored in boxes with other pox virus species. The patient had no contact with animals other than pets before the infection. None of the workers' contacts or pets had similar symptoms. So it's... Essentially, it's a mystery, you know, right? Although it is not clear exactly how the worker was infected, the authors of the study write, overall, the data suggests that the patient was likely infected by handling laboratory stock virus reagents or contact with environmental surfaces, which were contaminated with cowpox virus. So very interesting uh, uh, story that, that happened nearly a decade ago in the U.S., but again, this was laboratory acquired. It wasn't via an animal, via uh, a, a cow or via a cat or anything like that. It was a laboratory acquired infection. And let me go ahead and close with this pretty interesting story. And this is out of Goats and Soda. Uh, that's part of NPR. And they said, what's the real story about the milkmaid and the smallpox vaccine? Okay, so this, I found this kind of interesting because, of course, we know um, Edward Jenner's story. And it goes on to say, once upon a time, a long time ago, there was a beautiful milkmaid. Her face was flawless, her complexion peaches and cream, her smile confident as she bragged, I shall never have smallpox for I have had cowpox. I shall never have an ugly pockmarked face. A 13 year old orphan boy heard the milkmaid's boastful declaration of immunity or so the story goes. The boy was Edward Jenner, an apprentice to a country surgeon. Jenner's name would one day be famous for developing the world's first vaccine, which would eventually rid the earth of the scourge of smallpox. And the story of his boyhood inspiration for developing the vaccine is a classic of medical history, told in, a, in an 1837, bio, 1837 biography and repeated endlessly over the years. Uh, However, it looks like there was a study that came out in recent years that's testing the theory. You know, did this actually happen? And um, it says, Dr. Arthur Boylston had blown the lid off the milkmaid story in a commentary in the latest issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, the, mil excuse me, the myth of the milkmaid. I'm expecting fire and brimstone, chuckles Boylston, Professor Emeritus of Pathology at the University of Leeds and his senior teaching fellow at Oxford. Everybody loves the milkmaid story. 
I guess you could say it's legendary, carried on from generation to generation. And uh, I've probably repeated it myself a number of times in undergraduate lectures. And let me see if I can get to the likelier scenario. And they said, because there is another storyline backed by letters, diaries, and research notes that Boylston uncovered in the course of his research, it involves a country doctor named John Fuster, whose story unfolded in 1768, exactly at the same time the young Jenner was supposedly listening to the milkmaid's speculation about her immunity. Like other medical practitioners of that time, Fuster inoculated people with smallpox virus, offering them bed, board, and medical care in a large house he obtained for the purpose. He would stay until he was usually he would stay until what was usually a mild case of the disease passed. He treated a group of farmers in Thornbury, not far from where young Jenner was an apprentice. Some of the farmers whom Fuster had deliberately exposed to smallpox were already immune to the disease. Fuster could tell because they had no reaction to inoculation. Typically, people would get a big sore on their arm and a very mild case of smallpox. If they already had smallpox, that they wouldn't respond. But there was something unusual about these farmers who were inoculated but didn't get the typical sore. They insisted they never had smallpox. Then, according to a letter Fuster wrote, one farmer said, I have had the cowpox lately to a violent degree, if that's my odds, if that's any odds. Fuster inquired further. He found that all the farmers who were not responding to the smallpox inoculation never had smallpox, but did previously have cowpox. His conclusion, they were immune to smallpox from exposure to cowpox. And it goes on and on. So it says, who, who made the myth? So how did the milkmaid myth get started? At the time, the first and only mention of the milkmaid story was by Jenner's friend and first biographer, John Barron, several years after Jenner's death. According to Boylston's research, other doctors were then criticizing Jenner, questioning how he ever made the connection between cowpox and smallpox immunity. Jenner himself never explained how he developed the theory that led him to the 1796 experiment. After Jenner died, his biographer was trying to protect Jenner's reputation, says Boylston. John Barron probably made up the milkmaid story as a way to show how Jenner had come across the idea of the cowpox-smallpox connection. The true story is not as much fun as a folktale about a beautiful milkmaid, says Boylston, but it represents good science. What I like about it is that Fuster is a very ordinary country doctor. He was a clinical observer. He looked at his patients. He listened to them. No doubt people will, mess, will miss the milkmaid myth, but we should not lose the story entirely. After all, Jenner took the cowpox lesions from Sarah Nelms to vaccinate James Phipps. And Sarah was a milkmaid. Anyway, very interesting um, uh, story there. And I'll go ahead and link to that if you want to read the whole thing uh, for yourselves. Anyway, so that's uh, a little bit about cowpox and a little bit of the tales, the, the lore, the, the different animals that are infected, and what is human infection like. So if you like this video, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, Comment below and please share it with your friends. That we, that's how we get the word out on Outbreak News TV. And I appreciate you watching.